Hello, Farmer Ray. Remember my life report? I showed you how we can grow vegetables in your garden and make the tomatoes, the cucumbers and everything taste like what they should? Because we learnt when I was a young fellow back in the 40s, 50s and 60s, we knew how to grow things the natural way. Why? Because we didn't have chemical fertilisers in those years. They hadn't invented such a range of chemical fertilisers. We didn't have pesticides, herbicides and fungicides. And that's why we had good food. More than that, most of the food that you bought in the shops was fresh, so it wasn't poison for you to eat. Today, I want to share more with you about the cancer healing trees that you can grow in your garden and why the information concerning them has been suppressed. I'm going to show you in this report that there is, for example, and I'll put on the screen later, 57 acetogenins of the Ananasia tree group that they are copying. Out of the 57 that they are known, 41 applications of patent have been applied to try and patent them. Who by? The very chemical companies that are going to tell you not to have alternative medicine. The very chemical companies that are going to tell you that this message is a bit of quackery and take no notice of it. Well, if that be so, why is it that they want to copy the compounds out of the trees that I'm going to show you in this report? Unfortunately, we have emerged into, or evolved, migrated into a world of chemically controlled. Everything we do now is chemically controlled. You know, it's amazing, but our grandmothers, our great-great-grandmothers knew more about how to keep the body healthy than the doctors do today. Now, this is not a slight against the doctors or the medical fraternity, but I would just like them to realise that there are more ways of treating their patients than giving them a prescribed drug from a chemical company. As I said, these chemicals that they are prescribing came out of the botanical kingdom, out of plants and herbs. You know, 43 years ago, Dr. Otto Warburg told the world what caused cancer. Did they take any notice? No. Dr. Otto Warburg gained two Nobel Prizes. And he also said how to prevent cancer. So why aren't they taking any notice of him today? You're going to see why when we show you this report. Firstly, let's have a quick look at the scientific report on the acetogenins out of the, out of the Ananasius tree group. Now this material is under copyright to Rain Tree Nutrition Incorporated in Carson City to go through some of the traditional uh, uses that this Guanabana tree has been used for and in front of you on the screen now as you can see it's been used for bronchitis and coughs, colitis, diarrhea, dysentery, fevers, hydropsy. It's also used for mouth sores and parasites. It's an astringent, it's a communitive, emetic, head lice, insecticide, parasites, skin parasites and worms. It will get rid of the worms out of your colon. If you also see here that the leaf is used for asthenia, asthma, childbirth cough, diabetes gripe, heart tonic, hypertension, nervine, parasites, sedatives and spasms. It is used for abscesses. And it's also used for arthritis pain, Asthenia, asthma, astringent, bronchitis, catarrh, colic, cough, diabetes, diuretic, dysentery, edema, fever, gallbladder disorders, gripe, heart, hypertension, indigestion, infections, intestinal worms. Look at the list here. It also includes malaria, nervine, nervousness, neuralgia, palpitations, parasites. It includes rashes, rheumatism, ringworms, and it's a sedative, skin disorders, spasms, and so on. This is a marvellous herb, an unbelievably good tree to have in anyone's backyard. Now, it also tells you here that the um, chemistry of what is available there in the Asenogenins, and for those that are students on this, 
I'll put this here for a second or two and you can see what is actually in the fruit, the leaves, the tree and the bark. There you have it. Now if you want to do some more research, if you go into rain-tree.com, this is what you will find. And in their particular research, it'll tell you here that the guanabana tree, the graviola tree, is very, very good for these following ailments. It kills cancer cells, slows tumors growth, kills bacteria, kills parasites, reduces blood pressure, lowers the heart rate, dilates the blood vessels, it's a sedative, it relieves depression, reduces spasms, kills viruses, reduces fever, expels worms. Now what else do you need? That's what it can do for you just growing in your backyard. You know, we showed you in the last report how there was 53% of the people that went into hospital came out worse than what they went in with. There's another report that we're going to show you of how bad the chemicals are on millions of people. The side effects is absolutely devastating. Now here we're going to show you from SBS Television, a program which was called Insight. It was last Tuesday night and it's about drugs and doctors. Now it's going to show you how billions of dollars are spent to promote the chemical drugs to give to you but in, in balance how many dollars are spent to promote to you the natural remedies, the natural fruit, the natural teas that, that these chemical companies have copied, they've synthesized and they want to sell you the same compound back to you for millions of dollars. Now here's the first part of the report and part two will be in the next episode. We can't put it all on this particular video. In part two you're going to see more of what happened with Insight Drugs and Doctors. Here's the first part. Have a look with me. The way that the world works. I mean, what's the difference? At least this is out in the open. At least it's transparent. Look, I have absolutely no problems with drug companies being philanthropic to the Baker Institute or others, and, and that's that's wonderful. Um, and it is an important corporate responsibility to fund that sort of research. But to tie donations to doctors prescribing a specific drug is not appropriate. And as I say, it does, it came from a marketing budget quite rightly because the aim of a marketing budget is to get brand names uh, prescribing in perpetuity. It's to get that brand name into a doctor's head so that even when a drug goes off patent, the drop doctor keeps on writing the more expensive drug. Mm. And Gary, that's the problem. that is what's happened now. You have the donation yes. now. Yes, to, to good causes. Was it a mistake? Well, yes, I guess in the sense that um, now we're having to do it a different um, way and I understand that uh, probably this is the true test of whether it was a donation or not, the fact mm. that it's well, going ahead. Well, I just want to comment on what Ken said about the uh, prescriptions for the, for the drug post uh, the patent expiry. I mean, the way that it, things operate in Australia today is that the pharmacists get incentivised by the government, $1.50 for every time they convert the original brand of when it goes off patents to the generic. 44% of drugs prescribed are branded expensive drugs uh, despite the fact that there are generics available and patients have got a plea. This is, a, this is after uh, generic substitution. So it's not working, although the government certainly is trying to make it work. It's a moving target. OK, OK, let's move on. I, I want to talk, because there's quite a bit to talk about tonight. I want to talk Australian pharmaceutical companies ran, I think, around 33,000 of them. They cost around $62 million. Um, more than half of that money was spent on hospitality, things like flights, meals, hotels, um, presumably for doctors, uh, or at least a lot for doctors. Why is the industry spending that kind of money, Will, on, on educational events? Well, for look, doctors? there's a couple of important points to, to uh, make here. What, one is that the Make, the makers and discoverers of the medicines are the ones that have all the information and it's only reasonable that they want to educate doctors about how to use those medicines in the context of on to educate doctors about how to use those medicines in the context of of the disease and so a number of educational events are conducted and uh, hence the figures that you just quoted and they are bona fide educational events it is the hospitality is purely secondary to the education that, that takes place there are tremendous amounts of uh, very very good education that take place across the whole of australia today on weekends and evening meetings i mean doctors won't give up their evenings or weekends just to go for a, for a meal they'll only do it because they're getting value out of it 
And I think you have to put all of these issues in perspective. We talked about representatives before. That's just one element. There's a whole lot of education, very good education, that takes place for the medical profession that is provided by the pharmaceutical industry. OK, Joanne, you're nodding your head. I really think that's true. I mean, we need it. We need to be able to find a way to work together and really openly. There is a balance. They've got the information. John? It's absolutely clear that, that the imperative for most education that's sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry is marketing, not education. There's absolutely no reason why we as a medical profession need to have any education provided by the pharmaceutical industry. The data that we need in order to be educated is freely available in the public domain. And we have to accept as doctors that we don't have a right to be given... Uh, very comfortable circumstances in which to have our education that other professions don't take for granted. OK, 